All right, so part two, biliary duct procedures, <clears throat> T-tube or delayed cholangiography, endoscopic retrograde, cholangiopentiography, ERCP. Um, everybody should be familiar with these, and this should kind of be a review um, of what we did at the beginning of the semester. So the biliary duct anatomy, this uh, diagram should look very, very familiar. Just refresh your memory on this. Um, the pancreatic duct of Wurzung, um, the ampulla, the sphincter. Uh, make sure that you know where those are, where they're located, what they're called. So postoperative T-tube or a delayed cholangiography. Um, this is when they would do it in the department. Now it's done um, in the OR suite. So performed in the radiology department. Now they're they're mostly done in OR. The T tube is placed in the common bile duct during the surgery and then extending outside the body and clamped off. So um, what they're saying here is what they used to do was they would go in surgery and place this T tube. And then in the radiology department, they would inject the contrast media into the T-tube to make every, make sure everything was working. So now they do it in the OR suite. They do everything there. And we usually uh, fluoro with the C-arm to make sure that everything is working correctly. They may come to the radiology department and under fluoro have dye injected into that um, tube extending outside of the body. And then uh, fluoro images will be taken as the dye is injected in um, to make sure that everything is working. So responsibility of the technologist, once again, your fluoroscopy suite, set it up, uh, set up the exam tray, whichever tray they have, select and prepare the contrast media. So you're going to go draw the contrast media or get it out of a Pixis. You're going to take a scout image. Uh, make sure that you have your lead aprons available for everybody. Monitor the patient during the procedure. If you're not monitoring just as far as uh, how the patient's feeling and how everything's going, um, they may have a nurse in there that's going to actually be tracking the vitals, but um, usually not. Um, follow standard precautions when handling the bile, and then if there's any bile that is collected, and then you're going to take conventional radiographs if requested. Um, a lot of times they're not, but if they are, um, you'll know what the protocol is for your hospital, and then you'll just follow those accordingly. <clears throat> so ERCP, endoscopic retrograde, cholangio, panc pancreatography. Um, this is usually what you see as far as the ERCP done in, the, um, done in like a surgical suite. They go down, uh, they go through the mouth and down uh, the esophagus into the stomach and then they'll follow around. So the procedure is an endoscope inspection, cannulation, and then injection of, bile, uh, injection of the bile ducts with the use of the endoscope. And you can see here, so that will curve back around and go up in through that sphincter. They'll inject dye and see if there's any anything that's clogged, any stones they need to remove. Um, they may open that sphincter a little bit more to allow better flow of bile. So clinical indications for an ERCP, uh, patency, openness of biliary, pancreatic ducts, um, undetected coliliths, which are stones, and then small lesions or strictures within the biliary pancreatic ducts. So um, any of these are indications for having an ERCP done. So part three, so part two, that's just a review. Make sure you go back and look at that um, in our earlier chapters. And then moving on to part three, the histosalpiniogram, histosalpiniography, um, an AP scout projection of the pelvis. So this is your initial picture. Before the radiologist comes in, you're going to take an AP uh, image of the pelvis. Uh, you may cone down a little bit or it may be the entire pelvis. And uh, so it's the anatomy for the female reproductive organs. This is a sagittal perspective. So what they're 
looking at is they're going to inject that dye and they're going to follow it up the fallopian tubes to make sure that those fallopian tubes are clear, that there's not um, any strictures in there, that everything um, is working correctly. So as they uh, come into the vagina, they are going to uh, then come around into the cervix and then inject that dye up into those fallopian tubes, like I said, to make sure that they are clear. So the uterus, the frontal perspective, so you have the uh, external os, the internal os, and then they're going to go in and they're going to um, go into the right fallopian tube and then into the left fallopian tube. A lot of times they'll go in, if you're taking images, as they inject dye, you'll take an image of the pelvis and then in they inject dye into the left, then they'll go ahead and uh, take a picture. Usually any more it's done uh, via fluoroscopy as uh, as the radiologist injects the dye, he'll uh, make the exposure, save the image, he'll make the exposure, save the image, and then that way he has a record of the fallopian tubes if there's any uh, stricture, if the dye's not going where it should go, if there's anything that's wrong, he'll be able to um, read that in his notes. So a hysterosalpingogram usually called an HSG, so clinical indications, infertility assessment, so that's mainly what it's done for, is it's a lot of younger female patients that come in, they haven't been able to get pregnant, this is a test that they can do, an HSG, to test for fertility, to see if those fallopian, fallopian tubes are uh, free and clear and able to do what they're supposed to do. So demonstration of intrauterine pathology, if there's anything inside the uterus, evaluation of the uterine tube following tubal ligation or reconstructive surgery. So if they have a tubal ligation, they may have this just to make sure that the ligation took, uh, that there's no connection between it. And then HSG may serve as a therapeutic procedure. So a lot of times as the with it as a therapeutic procedure, um, they may have a, an HSG, they'll go ahead and do that HSG, and then with the injection of the dye, sometimes it cleans out the fallopian tubes, and several weeks later, or a month later or two, uh, a lot of times the female patient ends up pregnant, and it's because of the HSG, and that's where the therapeutic part of it comes into play. So... <clears throat> Uh, contraindications for an HSG. So when you would not do an HSG, if a patient is pregnant already, you're not going to do an HSG. If there's inflammatory disease within the pelvis, you're not going to do that inflammatory. Uh, you're not going to do that HSG. And then uterine bleeding. So um, if they're on their menstrual cycle, you're not going to do that HSG. So whenever they schedule an HSG, they give the uh, the patient a window of when to come in for their HSG so they don't have active uterine bleeding so the HSG can be performed um, under proper conditions. So your HSG tray, uh, your equipment is, is the tray. You're going to have a speculum. You see the speculum right here. Uh, sterile drapes cannula or balloon catheter and the cannula or balloon catheter here and that is just to uh, be able to get into the fallopian tube go ahead and inflate the balloon and then inject that contrast up into uh, the fallopian tube and then your contrast media iodinated water soluble is uh, preferred and is what is used so it is the iodinated contrast material so imaging equipment is your fluoro table uh, it's going to be done on the fluoro table. Uh, your scout um, and then a post injection. So a lot of times with a post injection, you're going to be able to see the, the catheter and then they're going to inject. You'll take a picture, inject again, take another picture, and then they may rotate them. LPO and or RPO, um, depending on which fallopian tube that they're looking at, just to uh, show it free of superimposition and get a better image of it. So moving on to part four, myelography, radiographic study of the spinal cord and its nerve root branches that use 
that uses a contrast medium. So you're introducing contrast into um, the spinal cord region, not into the spinal cord itself, but into, into that CSF fluid that runs up that spinal cord. Okay, so your um, injection site is L3, L4. Um, so you have the conus medullaris and then you have the, um, the smaller cords coming off so it's not as compact. And that's why they use that L3, L4 site. So they're not as apt to um, inject into the solid spinous, uh, spinal cord itself. But they're getting into the CSF which uh, encapsulates that spinal cord. So that's why you'll always use um, L3, L4 um, puncture site. So clinical indications, um, HNP, um, herniated nucleus pulposus, the, um, a tumor, um, cysts, or trauma. So if you had back trauma, trauma to your spinal cord, they may do that. Um, so trauma, bony fragments. Um, you may end up with uh, having to have a myelogram. So contraindications, when you will not do it, if there is blood in the CSF, you're not going to do a myelogram. Uh, arachnoiditis, so itis, inflammation, inflammation of the arachnoid, you're not going to do a myelogram. Increased intracranial pressure, so if you have intracranial pressure, you're not going to do a myelogram because it's going to add to that pressure. So the myelogram wouldn't be recommended. On a recent lumbar puncture, if you had one, they're not going to do another one because they're not going to want to introduce more contrast into an area that has already had contrast. They're going to go ahead and wait a while, let it flush out of, this, out of the body, and then um, do the second one. So uh, patient and rim preparation, pre-medication is usually given to patients for lumbar punctures. They will have an informed consent, usually filled out by a nurse, not something that you will do. Uh, RF room, so floral room. Um, the table has to be able to tilt. So 90 to 15 degree tilting table. And then shoulder braces, because they're going to be um, prone, and you're going to tilt them uh, Trendelenburg and then maybe tilt them Fowler, but mostly Trendelenburg to get that spinal, uh, that iodine to run down towards uh, or up towards the um, C spine and T spine. Um, shoulder braces and then ankle restraints on the footboard just to keep them from sliding off the table uh, secures the patient so they don't slide. Needle placement and injection process. So position for the lumbar puncture is prone. You can give them a support under their belly. A lot of times it's not necessary. Sometimes it is. Um, you can give them um, a cushion to go ahead and lay on whatever's comfortable for them. So lumbar puncture, prone or left lateral position. So they may be rolled a little bit to uh, towards the left, just depending on the radiologist. They may not be completely PA prone. They may have a little rotation to them. Uh, Spinal fluid, uh, it usually is collected, so your tray that you're going to open is going to have some collection tubes, and then um, they may collect that, and then they'll, in, they'll uh, insert that contrast medium and then remove the needle. So your myelogram tray, you can see the collection tubes here that they'll have, the spinal puncture needle, um, the, um, the syringe for the lidocaine for deadening, um, a little bit of, a, of tubing to connect onto the spinal puncture tube and then to drip it into the collection tube. So trays sometimes can be a little bit different, but um, a lot of them are, have the same stuff in there. So this myelogram, this is a cisternal puncture. So this is different than just a regular myelogram. It's cisternal puncture. So you're going to do it erect. The patient is sitting erect on the edge of the table and you're entering at C1, C2. So the patient is kind of tilted forward a little bit, head down. That gives you access to C1 and C2 for this cisternal puncture. Uh, myelogram contrast media, non-ionic is preferred and what's usually used and water-soluble, iodinated based. Um, 
one hour radio opacity, which is what um, everybody usually has with that um, iodine based, uh, the water soluble iodine based. Um, so it can be excreted by the kidneys, washed out by the body itself. This is, this is spot images of lumbar myelogram with an RPO and an LPO. Usually isn't done anymore. When they do these and inject contrast, about the only imaging that you're going to do is a cross table just to make sure that you can see the contrast material within the uh, spinal canal. Um, and then once that is visualized, the radiologist is, is going to say that's good. And then they're going to go to um, uh, usually CT or MRI um, depending on their orders. So spot imaging, um, the radiologist will do the spot imaging um, and then like I said you'll probably do a cross table just to verify that it's there. But they're going to tilt the table in different positions so they're going to tilt the table and then they may have the patient roll in different positions and they're just visualizing under fluoroscopy the flow of that iodinated contrast uh, so they know that it is um, visible and uh, in the area that's necessary before they go ahead and go to um, CT. So cervical myelogram is a horizontal beam. So you're still um, injecting the contrast into L4, L5. They're going to be uh, Trendelenburg. The contrast is going to flow towards the um, cervical spine. And then you're going to do a cross table lateral C-spine um, horizontal central ray to C4, C5 so you can visualize the contrast and then they're going to go ahead and go to CT or MRI to have follow-up images. You're just verifying that the contrast material is in the, uh, in the cervical canal. So cervical myelogram positioning, you may also need to do a swimmer's uh, position depending on the shoulders. So always keep in mind, always keep in mind that if your shoulders can't come down far enough and the shoulders are blocking the C-spine, you will need to do a swimmer's position and then go ahead and horizontal central ray to C7 to pick up the rest of that um, spinal canal, cervical spinal canal. Uh, thoracic myelogram, so this is a positioning to, to view whether the uh, contrast material is in the, the thoracic canal. So this is showing a right lateral decubitus AP, left lateral decubitus, right and or left lateral. So either one of those can be done. Central ray horizontal to T7. Most of the time when you have, when you're dealing with um, contrast in the spinal canal, you're, you'll do a horizontal beam, so cross table lateral L spine, cross table lateral T spine, cross table lateral C spine. Um, they don't do these a lot anymore as far as an AP right or left lateral decubitus. They just do the cross table uh, laterals and then they go off to um, CT, MRI to finish their imaging. But know that depending on where you work, these are um, images that can be done for your thoracic myelogram. Uh, so left lateral decubitus PA, horizontal central rated T7. Also remember and keep in mind that when you're doing a T-spine and you're doing it PA, you're going to have magnification of that T-spine because it's farther away from the image receptor. So more often than not, an AP is more desired than a PA. So AP is less magnification, PA is more magnification. Thoracic myelogram positioning, right or left lateral, this is a vertical beam. So um, <clears throat> instead of a cross table, you can put them on their side and then you're just going to do a vertical beam and pick up that T-spine. So vertical central ray to T7. Uh, lumbar myelogram positioning semi-erect horizontal beam. So this is just with the table tilted. Um, you're going to rotate your, your collimator head and then you're going to do a cross table 
L spine, central ray to L3, collimate, possible additional projections, um, anterior obliques, PA or AP. Um, but like I said, any more the imaging for this is is kind of going away except for a cross table lateral and they can be done in these um, uh, tilted table positions it just depends on what the protocol is and what the doctor is looking for so know your protocol and then make sure you know your radiologist for what he wants to image and this is what you're looking for so you're looking for that contrast in that spinal canal. So appropriate level with contrast medium, uh, optimal exposure factors, patient ID and markers, so make sure that you have a marker in your image, and then collimation is evident, and better collimation gives you a better picture and better visualization of that contrast material in the spinal canal. So um, evaluation criteria, circle, cervical, uh, myelogram, appropriate level, contrast material, optimal exposure factors, patient ID, just like your um, L-spine. And here you're seeing a trans-cervical lateral. So this is a swimmer's over here, and then this is um, just a regular cross-table lateral um, cervical myelogram. So you can see a little bit better uh, visualization of the spinal canal and a little bit better visualization of the uh, contrast material in that, um, in that cervical spine. So now they've gone to CT, so you can see the, the spinal cord, and then you can see the gray, which is the contrast material around that spinal cord. And even over here, you can see the contrast um, material in the cauda equina, and then up here, you get that denser uh, spinal cord running up and then the gray on either side of that spinal cord. And that gray is that contrast material or uh, contrast solution that, that's put in there. So I'm going to end here and then we'll pick up part five, orthoretinography uh, for our next part.